Hey guys, Alex Sutherland here, and today I've got a new video pack for you on 3-Bet Pots. I'm excited about it. I think there's a lot of uh, pretty unique information in here that you guys are going to get a lot of value out of. Our main goal is going to be a similar format to my Flop C-Bet Defense pack, where we're going to take this topic of 3-Bet Pots and really trying to understand how you know ranges fit together in these situations and at a pure theory level understand you know what makes three bet pots different why would we expect different behavior in them and then once we have that theory nailed down we will get into real world gto range builder solutions using uh you know realistic ranges and try and see to what extent our theoretical predictions match up to gtorb solutions when they do match up why when they don't why and how we can gain a deeper understanding of these situations so that we can play them better at the tables. So as an overview, the main you know key thing that is going to be driving this whole video is that three bet pots have very different relative range compositions and very different stack to pot ratios than single raised pots. And because of this, play is going to be substantially different. You know, whether there's an out of position three better, uh, and an in-position caller, in, in which case the out-of-position player tends to have the much more polarized range uh, and, and the much nuttier range when they have eight hands like aces, kings, etc. in their range. Um, you know That is a spot that you just don't really get into. Those relative range strengths is not a spot you get into in single raised pots very often. Um, similarly, even if it's an in-position three better with an out-of-position call, you still are kind of ending up with much narrower ranges than you might run into comparing that to like a cutoff open versus a big blind call in a single race pot. So even though the shape of the ranges might be similar, the you know width of them, how just how many hands are in there is very different. And then of course the stack to pot ratio is much, much smaller and that has a big impact. And the most noticeable, obvious in your face example of how play really diverges in three bit pots would come from, you know, some say cutoff open versus big blind three bet where the out of position player in a single race pot we saw from my flop C bet defense, they almost never want to lead. Uh, they almost never want to donk bet. That is due to range composition and stack size primarily in, you know, there's going to be some boards where they, the board is really unique and it changes the range compositions so much that in a single race pot, the out of position player would want to lead. But those boards are very few and far between. In three bet pots, just the structure of the preflop ranges is going to mean that on the vast majority of boards, the out of position player is going to have some substantial leading range. And you know, there's some old ideas around why this is. People used to have this idea of initiative, which was generally just that for some magical unknown reason, the player who bet last on the previous street probably is the guy who should bet first on the next street. Um, there's no game theoretical logic to that supposition, but it also is actually reasonably accurate. And it comes from understanding range compositions. Uh, most of my more advanced viewers will already know some of this, but we're going to go into it in way more depth and really understand not just how the range composition matters, but uh, you know why polarized ranges tend to benefit from betting out of position and how stacks in conjunction with range composition play a large role. Uh, you know, in isolation, you can take the exact same ranges and, you know, in scenario A with shorter stacks, it might be GTO for the out of position player to lead 100% of the range and take those exact same ranges, make the stacks a lot deeper. It becomes GTO for the out of position player to lead 0% of their range. Um, so what we're going to do is really look at some, you know, simpler theory examples, uh, illustrating those points, try and understand them more deeply and then get into our real world examples, which are gonna be again, focused on six max uh, situations, although I will briefly mention some heads up, sit and go ones. And for those of you guys who are curious about heads up, sit and go spots, we have our flop library, which will be coming out very soon. That has a lot of heads up, sit and go stuff in it. So stay tuned for that. Um, for this video though, what I'm gonna be focusing on is going to be six max cutoff versus button and cutoff versus big blind. And we'll be looking at two different types of button three betting ranges, um, a linear three betting range and a polarized three betting range, and looking at how those two ranges affect C betting in the three bet pots. And then 
Uh, also taking a more hand wavy approach because I don't think you can really say anything too concrete about free flop play, but at least discussing informally some of the trade-offs between polarized and linear three betting in position. So that's what we have on our plate. Let's get into it a bit. Um, in terms of the theory of betting out of position, you know, at the core, the question we really need to answer is why do we bet? You know, why do we bet in position or out of position? What drives the reasons for betting? Uh, obviously, this is a very complicated question because we bet, you know, the core answer is we bet when it's higher EV than our other options. So when it's plus EV to bet depends on, you know, what the EV of checking is, what the EV of folding is, what the EV of, you know, future streets on future runouts are if we take any of those actions. Folding simple, it ends the game, but things like checking are not as simple. Um, obviously, there's some really simple reasons to, to bet, which is, you know, the kind of standard you're either betting for value or as a bluff thinking. And those are very important reasons to bet, but they're definitely not the only reasons to bet. And if we just think about those reasons to start with, range polarization is king. Uh, you know, what's going to affect when you want to bet or not, if you're betting for value, you need to have the nuts and, you know, to, to be getting good value out of it. And you need to have some bluffs if you're going to be bluffing. So one would think that whoever's range has, uh, you know, the, the best value hands and the most air hands is going to do most of the betting. And this is kind of the obvious simple answer, which is true, but definitely doesn't show the whole picture. And the kind of standard theory example that really demonstrates this is the clairvoyance game from the Mathematics of Poker, which I talked about in my previous pack. I will very quickly uh, restate the setup for any new viewers here. Um, the idea is that there's one player who has a range that is, uh, you know, nuts or air. He only has two possible hands, either it holds the nuts or the air. And his opponent always has a medium strength hand that beats his opponent's air and loses to his opponent's nuts. And the question is, uh, what does optimal play look like in this game in the Mathematics of Poker? They look at a few variations of it. The one I'm going to talk about here is in Chapter 19. It is the multi-street version. And it turns out that in that game, uh, position is irrelevant. Who, you know, whether you're in position or out of position doesn't matter. The range polarization completely dominates, and the out of position, the merged hand player who just has a bluff catcher, never wants to bet. The polarized range player always wants to bet, and <clears throat> this that fact is true. You know, always means always with his nuts and with as many of his bluffs as he can possibly get away with. And that general form of the strategy is true regardless of stack size, regardless of number tr of streets. Uh, that's just the solution always. And they show this in chapter 19 of the Mathematics of Poker. Uh, the polarized range player just bets a geometrically increasing amount with you know the right ratio of bluffs such that he's always betting the nuts and this you know result might lead you to think that you know that's kind of it it's simple you know polarized range is always bet there's you know bluffs and value those are the two main components of a betting range and that's all there is to it and this would kind of match up with this idea of initiative in the sense that the person who bet last round probably had the more polarized range last round. And, you know, if the card that came didn't drastically change the state of the board, or, the, you know, the, the strength of the ranges, he probably has the more polarized range this round, and he should bet again. And, you know, this clairvoyance model really enforces the idea that there's, like, one guy who's just checking and calling sometimes, one guy who's betting, and it's purely a function of range strengths. But what we're going to see is that if we look at even just slightly more complex examples, still toy games, Things like position, runout coverage, and the stack to pot ratio can have huge effects on uh, betting frequencies. And have you know these are all reasons to bet. And we can't really understand what a good betting frequency is until we start with understanding why you would bet in the first place and really drill into that. So the way we're going to start with that is trying to get a directional understanding by the dry up balancing game. And by a directional understanding, what I mean is understanding how factors like being deeper or more shallow affect it, how factors like being in and out of position affect it. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at GTO Brain Teaser number nine, which is a toy game I made up that I think somewhat biasly uh, really hones in on some of these factors and has some surprising results that even most experienced players wouldn't expect or fully understand. 
And we're going to look at four variations of it so that we can really get this directional understanding. We'll look at a shallow version, a deep version, and then for each of those we'll look at when we flip the positions. So we'll get four total variations. And then the final thing we'll use this game to look at that I'm not going to do you know, every possible variation of is to get an understanding that even future range polarization matters. So we're going to look at a game where the uh, polarized player's uh, air range has flush draws and straight draws and compare that to a case where he only has flush draws to get a better understanding of this run out coverage concept that I mentioned before.